Hi, John Kavakis here. Just want to take a moment and thank you for spending some time with us this morning and welcome you to our service. Our sermon this morning is out of Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 48. It's called Get Dressed. And we're going to talk about how we need to be on the constant lookout for our Lord Jesus Christ because he could come back at any moment. Now, we're going to serve communion at the end of the service. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've been born again, then you're welcome to join us. So you can get the elements ready, have some bread or some crackers ready and some juice or whatever it is that you can grab from around your house and we'll celebrate the sacrament of communion together. Let's join our service, which is already in progress. As we continue in an attitude of worship, the word of God from 2 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 1. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they will deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are dissolved will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which, which righteousness dwells. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12. We're going to be looking at uh, verses 35 through 48. Some of the handouts say 40. And I don't know who made that mistake. <laughs> Me. <laughs> While you're turning there, I want to share something with you. I, I was a young boy. I, was, I think I was five or six. And there was this birthday party that my mom wanted to take me to. And I was all excited about it. And uh, she... She said, okay, now I'm going to get you ready, and then you're going to wait for me, and I'll get ready. And, you know, we had a small house, one bathroom, all that sort of thing. So she, she had me go in and, and take a shower and dress me up in one of her favorite outfits. She had a little bow tie and a vest. That's where I get this stuff from. And, uh, and then said, now you wait here in the living room while I go get ready, and we're going we're gonna to leave here in about 20 minutes. I'm pretty excited about the party. You know, and so she went, and I'm in the living room, and I thought, well, it's a nice day outside. I think I'll go outside. So I'm outside and wandering in the backyard, and there's a pool, a swimming pool. And I'm looking at it, and it's warm out, and I thought, huh, that looks refreshing. <laughs> I dipped my hand in there. Oh, that felt good. I'm going to dip my other hand in there. 
oh, that felt good. I'm going to splash some water in my face. That felt good. I'm going to dip my face in the pool. And I leaned over and fell in. And so about that time, my mom walks out. <laughs> she said, what are you doing? I said, ah. <laughs> and she said to me, you are so easily distracted. That's our truth for today. We are easily distracted, brothers and sisters. And, the, the, and, and we'll see what, what Luke has to tell us about this as Jesus continues his teaching of the disciples. The last time we were together, we found out that God has this, that our focus on riches and material things can create a spiritual poverty in us. And it, it kind of removes God as being the highest priority in our lives. This is something that keeps on popping up in Luke's gospel. We also found out that our anxiety and worry, two different things, that anxiety creates a poverty that can cause us to act apart from God on our own, and that worry can cause a poverty that causes us to distrust him. So our sermon for today is get dressed. I had to get dressed for that party, and I allowed myself to get distracted, but the point is to get dressed. Now, that'll make a little bit more sense as we, as we go through the passage for today. So we have in this passage two admonitions, two encouragements, um, and, in light, and the, the, all this has to be taken in light of the fact that Jesus is instructing his disciples on how to carry on the ministry after he's gone, and he's already kind of gotten to the point to where things aren't going to be this easy. So we have these two admonitions, and the first one is a set of exhortations that we see in Luke 12, verses 35 through 40. And the second one is a set of implications uh, of those exhortations that we're going to see in 41 through 48. So let's take a look at these exhortations. Verse 35, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And verse 36, be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. So this phrase here, dressed for action, action comes from the Greek word for let your loins stay girded. Now, it's important to understand exactly what's happening here because this is a reference to Exodus 12, where God is instructing Moses on what the people should do prior to the Passover coming. And, you know, they've gone through all the plagues, and uh, Pharaoh's been stubborn and all this, and uh, God had already told Moses, you know, Pharaoh's going to be stubborn, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver you from here. And now we're down to the final plague, and God is saying, get ready to go. Tell my people to get ready to go. And, and he says, do it with your belt fastened, sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. When I say go, you go. Don't, don't wait for anything. They're not even allowed to put any leaven in their bread because there's no time for the bread to rise. So dress for action. Keep your lamps burning. Now, this is a reference to the virgins that we see in Matthew 25, that not only do they have to keep their lamps burning, but they also have to conserve how they use the lamps so that they have enough oil to, to wait until the bridegroom comes. So the message is this, work at preparing, get ready, be, be intentional in all this, be in constant expectation of the master to come. Now he's not clear about who this master is yet, but he will be. So Jesus continues in verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Now there's a blessing for those who are diligent to prepare for the master to arrive. And the blessing is beyond imagination. It, it, it's an incredible blessing. And, and so here, here's one of those verses that, that we may look at and kind of go over lightly, but look at what the, third, the second half of verse 37 says. Truly I say to you, he, the master, watch this, will dress himself for service and have them, those who have been diligent to prepare, 
those who have been anticipating his return, have them recline a table, and he will come and serve them. That was totally unheard of. What master would put on the clothes of a servant and turn around and allow his servants to recline at table? Now, this is, this is a feast. And you know, the way they would do this, the tables were low, they'd have a bunch of pillows scattered around, they'd bring the food in, and everybody would, would lean and eat. And, and the servants would do all the work. They'd prepare all the food. They, they'd do all the presentation. They'd do all the cleanup and everything. Well, he says, if you're diligent to be ready when the, when the master comes back, he's going to serve you. Think about this. Jesus serving you, serving us. When? When we are obedient to do the things that he tells us to do. It's an incredible blessing. And what he's telling us to do is to be ready for his return. Be looking for it. Okay, I want to do that. When, when is that going to be? That'll help me get ready. Verse 38. If he comes in the second watch or the third and finds him awake, blessed are those servants. We, we don't know when. Now, when he talks about the second and third watch, he's talking about the second and third watches in the middle of the night. You know how long the night can be, amen? It seems like it could go on forever. I mean, the watchman is on the top of the wall. There's nothing going on in the city. There's probably no lights there. And the hours drag, and it seems like it could take forever. And we don't know. The second watch or the third watch. So we don't know when it's going to happen, but we need to be awake. And the thread through all of this teaching in 9, 10, 11, 12, is going to go on through 13, is that we need to live holy lives. We need to live like Jesus could come back at any moment. And there, there's a reason we don't know when he's coming back. And Jesus knows that we kind of need this explanation. Why aren't you giving us a date? Why don't you tell us a time? Then we'll know when to be ready. Verse 39, Jesus explains, But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. Now this isn't, this isn't a verse about some evil come knocking on the church door. It's a verse about the master saying, well, you know, if he told you that somebody was going to come while he was gone and break into the house, uh, you would probably slack off until that happened. <laughs> so I want you to be diligent. I want you to have your eyes open. So if we knew when, even if we can make a good guess, and, and let me just talk to you about this for a second. Because every year, some prophet stands up and says, the Lord's coming back in September. I don't know why it's always September. It seems to be the favorite year of false prophets. Favorite month. But I, and, and they, they kind of cloak all this with, I don't know exactly the minute but it'll be sometime on September 17th. And, and so, and you, you know, half of the evangelical world kind of holds their breath to see if this is really going to happen, uh, and, 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 and then it doesn't, and nobody says anything, and, uh, you know, we've had prophecies floating around for the last four or five months, none of which have become true, none of them. And yet, the, the next guy that stands up and makes a prophecy, people are going to go, oh, did you hear what's going to happen? So the Lord doesn't tell us this stuff, and he doesn't give a roundabout maybe on the 17th or the 19th, or maybe even the month of September, or maybe in 1972 or 1979 or 1999 or any of the... The Lord doesn't give any of those indications because... 
because nearly everyone would wait to get ready until that date. I don't have to worry about that. He's not coming until September. I mean, that's kind of the attitude we have. Now, not everybody, amen. Some people in the church are living in constant expectation. That's a fantastic thing. But brothers and sisters, we are far too easily distracted for God to trust us with that type of information. What Jesus is saying is don't be in the pool in the backyard when your mom's ready to go. (laughs) Don't get distracted from what you've been called to do and consumed by serving yourself. Now, there's a little bit of an, an ominous tone here, particularly when we take into account the passage that was read a little bit earlier out of 2 Peter 3. And there's this hint in here that for some folks, the return of Christ is going to be a very difficult time. We'll talk more on that in just a little bit. But for now, verse 40, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Now, Jesus makes it very clear. I've told you that I'm going to Jerusalem. I've told you that I'm going to die. But now I'm telling you I'm coming back. You have to listen very carefully to what I'm saying because you need to be ready when I come back. And I will come back, and the key phrase here is in an hour you do not expect. Now the clear message here is be alert, be ready. He could come back at any time. Be diligent. The moment you let your guard down, the moment you think everything's okay, that's when he's going to return. Don't take your eyes off the prize while I'm gone. Now, again, brothers and sisters, we just need to consider this carefully. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about eschatology. That's our, our doctrine, our beliefs on the end times, what happens in the final days. The statement of faith of the Evangelical Free Church of America says that we believe in his imminent return. And that's the concept we're talking about right here, that he could come back at any minute. But there's a lot of doctrine floating around out there that kind of interferes with this. And so once, once every two years or so, somebody sends me an article about something that's happening in Jerusalem. And it's significant because it's going to usher in the end times. And it's usually something like, did you know that they're growing a red heifer to sacrifice in Jerusalem? And so that when the end times comes, they will sacrifice this red heifer in the temple. Oh, and by the way, the temple's going to be rebuilt. They've got the gold implements right there underneath the temple. You can go see them. I kind of like that stuff. It's intriguing. It used to excite me until I began to try and reconcile that concept with the concept of imminent return. Because this concept that these things need to happen before Jesus comes is nothing more than telling me, don't worry, it's not going to happen right away. There's no temple in Jerusalem. Nobody's sacrificing a red heifer. Nobody's pulled the golden implements out of some secret basement somewhere. It ain't going to happen today. And because I'm a human being, when I hear that, I am far too easily distracted by the things that are going on. So we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful what our eschatology is. This exhortation here is for us to live like Jesus is in the other room and could come walking into our room at any moment. And the implications, well, you know what? What are the implications? I mean, the the first thing we kind of need to answer about whether or not this, this has any impact on my life today, your life today, is who is Jesus talking to? And, and, and at first that seems simple, but then maybe not. 
So who's Jesus talking to, and how, how will that impact the, their lives and their walk with the Lord? So in verse 41, Peter asks, he says, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? You know, oh, wait a minute, who are you talking to? Uh, and and uh, you, you know Peter, he's impulsive. He's got a lot of lessons to learn. I, I relate to him. I can be just as stubborn. And Peter could just as easily have said, you're not talking to me, are you? I mean, that's not for me. I'm, I'm, I'm the faithful one. I'll never leave you. But Peter wants to know who this is, who he's talking to. And Jesus appears to give this cryptic answer. And if we didn't know the context of the passage or the flow of these paragraphs, this is why, this is why I try to break this up into little bites as we go through a passage so that we can understand what the author is trying to tell us. If we didn't know the flow of this passage, we might miss what's going on here. Jesus wants to equip his disciples. He wants them to carry on after he leaves. He's just exhorted them to be vigilant because after he leaves, he's going to come back. And we know that Jesus is talking to his disciples, kind of. But Jesus really hasn't been all that clear on it, so Peter wants to know. And the question is, if he's talking to his disciples, well, who are the disciples? Because we've seen several different groups in this crowd. We've seen the 12, they're always with them. Back in chapter 10, we saw the 72 that were sent out. Is he talking to them? Is he talking to all of his followers? Is he talking to everybody, believers and people who need Jesus alike? In other words, is this just for the leaders? Is this just for the teachers? Is it for everybody in the church? Is it for everybody in the world? We would like to know that. Because if it's just for a certain group, maybe we're not in it and we don't have to worry about that. So who's it for? The leaders, the church, the world? And the answer is yes. And he doesn't just leave it hanging, he explains all this. And this is important to us because we've been waiting for over 2,000 years for him to come back. And we could very easily be distracted from what we've been called to do, and we've been distracted even more if we think he's not talking to us. So who are the disciples? Who waits? Verse 42. Watch this. And the Lord said... Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? So Jesus is using a little bit of a a mini parable here. You want to know who should listen to this teaching? The first answer is this, the leaders, the people in charge. Those who are in charge of caring for the house while he's gone. Those who have the responsibility to feed and nourish and care for the entire household. Verse 44, he says, truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Okay, so there's a promise involved in that. If you're faithful at this, then uh, there will be blessings that follow. But there's danger in being a servant. There's a responsibility that comes with it that needs to be recognized. Verse 45, but if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. Jesus says, okay, you're a leader. Don't let it go to your head. Don't begin abusing this. If that leader of those people takes advantage of those that they lead, if, they, if he abuses them, if he oversteps his authority, if he makes the charge he's been given more about himself, than about the one who gave him the charge. There's some danger in there, and there's a heavy price to pay. So the leaders have to be diligent, not only to wait expectantly for the return of the master, the return of the son of man, 
but they have to faithfully care for his people while he's gone. In verse 46, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. Yikes! So the next time somebody comes up and says, would you like to join church leadership? Think about your answer. Verse 47, and that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. Now, this is looking pretty dire. This is harsh. And it sounds like that someone in a position of leadership and seems to be a godly person will be punished for messing up. Well, we've got a whole body of scripture that's going to help us understand this, but it's not what's in this story right now. But if you stop and think about it, you can probably figure out what's happening. If this leader was truly a godly person, if he had been regenerated, if he was being made into a new creature, if he received a new heart, he would never have made such a selfish, harmful decision. He could never have abused God's children and never have been so self-centered. So hold on to that. Because that's what Jesus has been saying about the Pharisees. You know, they look pretty good to you. But Jesus knows their heart and knows that there's evil and darkness in there. Everyone thinks that they're godly people, but truly they're not. Jesus knows what's going on. He knows that they're self-consumed, self-satisfying abusers of the authority that he's given them. Now let's tie some of this together because Jesus in the previous passage talked about living a lie, being a hypocrite. And Jesus is still in that mode. So we need to understand everything that's going around around this moment here. These guys, any leader who pretends to be godly and is not devoted to the Lord with a desire to please him more than they have a desire for their own power or their own welfare. Any leader who's like that is in big trouble. God's going to deal with them. We don't have to deal with them. God will deal with them. But there is punishment and pain coming to those who preach scripture and live unholy lives. Every leader has to be ready, and the message is clear, but every leader has to be willing to examine his own heart as well. Because there'll come a day when he stands before the Lord and has to answer for everything he's done. Okay, so he's talking to the leaders. Verse 46, but the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating, will receive a light beating. Now, we see Jesus talking to more than just the leaders. He speak to those who don't know. And the word here is, is a derivation of the word uh, gnoso, and, uh, gnosko, uh, and, and it means to know experientially. It means to have an intimate knowledge of. So this is not just a passing knowledge. This is not somebody that, well, I read through the Bible one time 12 years ago, and I'm done with that. This is somebody who has an intimate knowledge of God, the body, uh, is scripture. Jesus is talking to those that, that do not have that intimate experience. Don't really understand what the will of the Father is. Well, they're going to be punished as well, only their punishment will be lighter. Th this is really not getting any better, is it? There's a lot of talk of punishment. And the implication that Jesus is making here tells us that he's speaking to those who are part of the body, part of the kingdom, but don't really know any better. If they offend the Father, there will be consequences. And in my mind, it's not leaders. These are people in the church that take it seriously. 
but not too seriously. You know, is being part of the church affecting you on Monday morning as well as it is on Sunday morning? These are people that dabble around the edges. They're saved, but they're not really participating. Jesus is talking to them. Now, the one thing we should understand, I mentioned earlier that there's a whole body of scripture behind this. So the one thing that we should understand, that these consequences, these punishments that we're talking about are not eternal. There are earthly consequences for disobedience to God. There is no get out of jail free card in the scriptures. There is no don't worry, we're forgiven, we can do whatever we like. Okay. Now we know that's true not just from specific scriptures, but we know it from the, the arc of scripture. I mean, God takes these people out of Egypt, takes them through the wilderness. They don't listen to him when they get to the promised land Oh, we don't want to go. We're scared. And God says, okay, there are consequences for that. You're going to wander for 40 years. Well, he takes them back into the promised land, gives them all these incredible victories, and the next thing you have the book of Judges. And the book of Judges opens and closes with this statement. It was a time in Israel when everybody did what was right in their own eyes. If you don't see a parallel to what's happening today. <laughs> there are earthly consequences for disobeying God. Not necessarily eternal. So all those who know God, all those who know his word, will suffer some earthly consequences for disobeying him. Now, now Jesus takes this a step further. So we're talking to the leaders, talking to the church, not saying that everybody in the church is disobedient, just saying you've got to be careful. And if, if, if we understand what Jesus has been doing, we also understand that as Jesus breathes these things to the surface, he's giving his people an opportunity to repent. He's not saying all these things are going to happen to you, you're bad people. He's saying you can be good people with the help of the Holy Spirit. Repent, receive me as Lord and Savior, and all this stuff will be taken care of. So Jesus is not condemning. He's giving them the opportunity to turn towards him. And now he's going to take it a step further. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Now, I'm, I'm, this is going to be the John Kavakis interpretation of this, so take it with a grain of salt. There are people that will disagree with me on this, but here's how I read this. Everyone, each one, if you look at the entomology of the word, it means everyone. Now Jesus is talking to everyone, all men and women, and everyone has received much. Now let me explain what we're talking about here because the, the common interpretation is that those who have been blessed by God are the ones who have received much. But I'm here to tell you today that everybody in the world has received much. Everybody ever created has received a measure of God's grace. There are two types of grace. One of them is salvific, the grace that God sheds upon us that leads us to salvation. And the other is a concept called common grace. God has a plan of redemption for his, his people. That plan takes time. It is taking time. And during that time that God's plan of redemption is rolling out for his people, the world suffers common grace. In other words, for all those who are not saved, God doesn't destroy them the minute they offend them. They're allowed to live in the world that he's created and his blessing and will use for his glory. That's common grace. Everybody has received it. Everybody has a part of it. So much will be required of everyone. This is huge. This is on a cosmic scale. It's, it's expansive. It's unbelievable. We all have responsibility. We all have accountability. We will all answer 
for the way we've lived our lives. Well, I don't like that either. Because <laughs> it sounds to me like we're all going to be punished, doesn't it? Well, it's what the passage says. We've had these two admonitions. So we've, we've had this exhortation to live in anticipation of Im, his imminent return. And we've had the implication that there's going to be, there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a time when we, we answer for everything that we've done. Paul speaks of this in Romans chapter 14, starting with verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? He's talking to us. Or why do you despise your brother? For will we all stand before the judgment seat of God? For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Now, the traditional reading of that is all you people that don't have Jesus are going to pay. But this is everyone. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. He says, each of us. That should terrify us. That should cause us concern. And if you're not terrified, you should be. If you're hearing this sermon today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you're going to have to figure out who can stand before an all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God. And I'm going to tell you something. At that minute, he doesn't care whether or not you believe him in or not. You can't say, I'm sorry, I don't believe in you, so I'm not coming to your judgment. He's God. Who can survive his glory? Who can survive the radiance of his holiness, his purity? Who can survive standing in the presence of his perfection? And we heard what this moment is going to look like as we read this, the, the, the scripture. Let me go over this. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed since all these things are thus to be dissolved. What sort of people want you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. It's an incredible amount of destruction. And as scary as this is, when we read the rest of Scripture, we find out that there's a way to survive the day of judgment. Here's the next verse in 2 Peter. But according to his promise, we, as those of us who have repented of our sins, confessed them, and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth on which righteousness dwells. This is how we can anticipate the return of the Lord with joy because all that punishment all that wrath and all that burning for you and me and those of us who believe in Jesus Christ has been absorbed by Jesus Christ. He's taken it in our place. That day, that day is coming. I'm here this morning to tell you it's a lot closer than a lot of people think. That day is coming. If you know him, you're safe. If you don't, you need to run to him. You need to come to him. You need to confess that you need him, that there's no rescue from that fire other than Jesus Christ. Meanwhile, it's so easy for us to get distracted, isn't it? Distracted by issues, distracted by our circumstances. Everything that would distract us from what we've been called to do is going to burn. It's going to be gone. So we need to get dressed 
and we need to stay dressed. And we need to act like he could come knocking on our door at any time. And we need to share that with these people that are ready to burn. So communion is an observance of this salvation that we're talking about. <laughs> it's a remembrance of the fact that we have been rescued from this incredible cataclysm that's going to fall on the entire world, all of creation. Somebody said, well, what about aliens? They're going to. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for that moment where that first contact occurs because one of two things is going to happen. They're going to walk off that spaceship and say, have you heard about Jesus Christ? Or they're going to need to hear about Jesus Christ. That's our job, is to share that with them. So we have this communion, we have this sacrament that reminds us that not only has God given his only son for us to be able to engage in this incredible act of unity, but to make us agents and bearers of that message. So I'm gonna ask the deacons to come forward at home. Uh, if you have some, some juice and some crackers, you'll be able to participate with us. We're a body, whether we're present, whether we're not physically together or not, we're, we're still a body. We're going to uh, pass around in the sanctuary these little packets now if you haven't seen one of these before there's a top piece this red piece that peels back there's a wafer under there and then there's a lid that we can do the juice we're going to take the wafers together uh, and then we'll take the juice together so while these are being distributed go before the Lord and let him examine your heart ask him what part you play in this prepare, preparation to be ready and then we'll pray. Father, we thank you. It's just a little crust of bread. It's not enough to satisfy our hunger. Oh, but Lord, you've done an amazing thing with it. You've satisfied our souls. You've nourished us, Father, on your word. On the sacrifice of your son. So we thank you for this crust of bread, Father, that's a small reminder of such a huge thing that you've done. Sent your son to die so that we could be with you forever, Lord. Let us never take our eyes off that prize, that message. Let us be forever thankful for the moment the bread was broken and Jesus told us what it was all about. You think it's just bread? This is my body. It's just broken for you. Take and eat. And Lord, this little bit of juice seems so minuscule as well. How could it satisfy our thirst? How could it touch every, every cell in our body? How can it draw us closer to you? Well, Father, you did something supernatural. You told us for... 4,000 years that blood needed to be shed in order for sins to be remitted. And then you shed your blood, Father. Oh, what a glorious moment. The broken body brings us into your body. The shed blood brings us into your presence. It cleanses us. It renews us. It restores us. Thank you for the cup and when he lifted up and said this is my blood which is shed for you take and drink and now Lord we've heard your word we pray that by the presence and the power of your spirit Father you would impress that upon our hearts impress it upon us Father that we carry it with us and help us oh Lord when we err to err on the side of love. To err on the side of grace and mercy. Help us to see that, Father, that, that love, grace, and mercy can do for us what the terrors of your judgment alone could never do. 
Let your grace, Father, melt our hearts. Lift us up by your mercy and teach us to despise anything that displeases you. Let the same grace that saved us, let the same love that saved us pour from our hearts in rivers of living waters engulfing all those that we encounter. And when we fail to do this, help us, O Lord, to repent and err on the side of compassion with a love that would never harm neither the worst of all sinners nor the least or weakest of God's servants. We consecrate our lives to you, Lord, even unto death. And as we do, Father, we embrace the greatest of your promises, that we who believe in you will never taste the bitterness of death. So fill our hearts with a zeal for your glory, with a passion for your honor, with a devotion to your kingdom, and help us, O Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And we pray this in the name, in the character and nature of your only son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today online. Thank you for being here in presence. May the Lord bless you as the week goes forward. Have a great day. Pastor John here again to tell you that we really appreciate your spending some time with us. Love to hear from you. You can email me personally with your prayer requests or comments at kavakas, K-U-V-A-K-A-S, at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube at WBFVA. We're also on Facebook at Morton Bible Fellowship. And we have a worldwide web site as well, WBFVA.org. I hope today blessed you. I hope you have a blessed week. God bless you. We hope to see you again.